we appreciate you joining us. Um, as always, we will send out a following of this recording, um, and we do encourage you to put your questions in the chat throughout the session, and that way we can get to them towards the end. Uh, my name is Josh Ferguson, and I am the Senior Manager of Product and Content Marketing here at Verison, where we are providing material intelligence for global enterprises. Joining me today is Melissa Dietz, our Head of Customer Success. And Melissa joined Verison after many years leading innovation, operations, and supply chain efforts across the Coke industries. Also joining me today is Justin Noel, one of our Customer Success Managers here at Verison. And Justin joined after spending several years uh, leading consulting efforts and supply chain man management initiatives at Invista, as well as Scott Trade and some other consulting firms. So let's dive in right into the top. One of the things that we've been talking about for a while, Melissa and Justin, is you know trying to find that balance between working capital and how much risk you're willing to take on. Right. And so, you know, with the lingering effects of the disruptions that we've seen over the past several years, and now we have all this looming threat of economic downturn or the reception of it, at least, right? Organizations are constantly reevaluating how much inventory to have on hand versus how much risk they're willing to be exposed to. So, Melissa, we'll start with you. In your experience, uh, how have organizations, organizations traditionally tackled this balance between working capital and risk? Yeah, that's always been a really difficult thing to, to do, Josh. And, and typically, you know, a lot of times what happens is, is people just end up not being able to do it because it's such a complex problem. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, what I've seen, in at least in the companies I work for, are you have a centralized uh, with, with a corporate team that's trying to reduce working capital, um, as well as folks at the individual manufacturing facilities who are who are trying to balance um, inventory, but but not let the machines run down. So you know they live in the world of hey, I don't want a a fifty dollar O ring to shut down my multi million dollar line. So they tend to want to increase inventory. So you can imagine there's a tension there between those two teams, and mm -hmm. and how might you um, and what's going to happen with working capital. So. Traditionally, what what can happen over time are the the sites because they're on boots on the ground. They'll they'll slowly raise inventory over time. Then a corporate team will come in and go, okay, we need to cut and cut our working capital by some by some target number. Just say like ten percent. So that rolls down to the sites. They now have to adjust their inventory, and and because the analysis is complicated on what you need to keep and what you don't want to keep. They'll, they'll sometimes cut across the board and, and hit things that they really should have more of, which means that a line will go down. They won't have that part. They'll bounce that inventory back up, and then you get this kind of ebb and flow spiking of, of inventory over time that makes it really challenging to, to manage long term. Yeah, kind of a blanket approach versus a specific target, right? You know, so. That's right. Yeah. yeah. All right, Justin, what about you? I mean, how have you seen organizations struggle with this? Yeah, so, I mean, so like Melissa mentioned, it, it's really challenging for organizations to balance working capital alongside risk. Um, so when they decide to decrease working capital, you know, it almost always impacts, ends up impacting service levels. Um, I want to draw a comparison. So I'm, I'm a big NFL fan, you know, big big Falcons fan. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing this year, but um, with, you know, today's a big day in the NFL with it being, being cut day. So what that means is, you know, teams, Teams have 80 players on their roster today. By the end of the day, they have to cut down to 53 players. You know, so coaches have known this for months. It's no surprise. But let's say there was a case where, you know, GM went to a coach, said, I need you to cut 25% of your players, you know, overnight. Um, you know, so as a coach, what do you do? You probably look at things like you know, historical stats. Uh, you may, may put them through a combine, you know, learn their strengths, conditioning. Uh, there may be some recency bias, you know, say a, wide receiver had a big drop in a, in a preseason game, you know, probably think about that. Um, but at the end of the day, you're, you're trying to take all this information, um, you know, cut down your team without, without having an impact on team performance. And it's a little bit similar to what supply chains are dealing with today, but instead of, you know, say having 80 players are going to 53, you know, you have thousands or some of our customers have hundreds of thousands of materials. You're cutting these, you know, these downs, you know, like Melissa's point, you know, say 10% or, or X million dollars. Um, in similar approach, you're taking, you know, best data you can find, you know, almost always in perfect data. Again, there may be some recency bias. You, you may be stocked out of a part 
that led to an asset coming down. You know, tend to remember those situations for, for quite a while. Um, but all that to say, you know, when you're making these cuts, it's really, really difficult not to impact your service levels. I mean, you almost always see an impact. Yeah, but you're not always, you're not just talking working capital as well. You know, there's other constraints that you know, companies are dealing with. So an example would be um, things like warehousing space. You know, warehousing space certainly is an infinite. It's a real constraint a lot of a lot of companies face when they're when they're building inventory over time. We're more or less forced to cut inventory. It, one other thing I'll mention as well is around obsolescence. You know, it's a lot of times companies that do build inventory. Um, you have you have parts in your system of record. You know, you, you think you have the right material. You know, then you go to to get a rubber bill, a rubber gasket, and you find out that material is no longer good. So it's it's really misleading in that fact. You know, so there, there's a lot of challenges our customers facing. It's you know, that balancing working, working capital and risk. It's it's spacing constraints. And it's also things like obsolescence. Right. I mean, I think that's a lot. That's something that a lot of organizations don't you know consider. You know, how much does you know warehousing cost us? You know, and it's been going up over time. The labor associated with that as well. And then again, pro product lifecycle management. As you said, if something you know expires when it's on your shelf. That's something that you weren't accounting for. Now, you know, that's another cost you got to eat. So, so that gives us a good point, right? A good, a good transition into something that we've been talking about here recently, which is, you know, excess inventory as an insurance policy. But, you know, that can be a very expensive insurance policy. But, Melissa, this is something that you shared on our last session. So, let's take an opportunity real quick to, you know, remind the audience kind of what we mean by this insurance policy. Uh, and then we can expand from there. Yeah, good question, Josh. This was a phrase we we used a lot when I was um, in supply chain. So if you think about working capital, people will have tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in working capital if you look across the organization. And, and that's, in essence, money that's not not putting to good use. It's tied up in parts. Mm -hmm. And when you think about things, especially like Justin's talking about, if they could become obsolete or have a shelf life, it's it's even worse, right? Not only is your money not unproductive, you're actually, it, it's a bit wasteful because you'll end up either having to, to scrap the part or, or sell it on, um, on a secondary market for for a lot less than you paid for it. And that's why, you know, when I think about it, it's, it's really expensive insurance because you're putting, it's, it's, a lot of money that's not really put to good, not put to productive use up sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what about uh, overcorrection? Justin, have you ever seen where organizations may like overcorrect when it comes to excess inventory? Yeah, Josh, that's, that's a great question. And, and certainly it's it's very common. When I was in supply chain, you know, almost every time you, you made a uh, large cut to your MRO, you'd, you'd overcorrect or you'd, you'd overcorrect on the wrong materials. Um, so, so when I was in supply chain, one, you know, one case that along those lines that came up was around when we were taking assets down, you know, particularly over COVID when demand um, fluctuated like it did. You know, so, so what would happen is we, we would take an asset down. You know, we didn't need the capacity at the time. Um, we had the intent on bringing that asset up in the future. Um, but a lot of times what happens, we take the asset down, then, then the plant would end up needing you know, parts uh, that they couldn't get because of long lead times or other reasons. Um, so they'd go to that that down asset and steal the parts. You know, so over time, you, you basically cannibalize one of your assets. You know, from a supply chain perspective, you, you think you still have that capacity, but what would end up happening when you when the demand comes back um, and you need that asset, you would you basically re you try to restart it. You, what you think would be a, a one or two week restart would turn into a, a three to six month project, um, and that's, that's all that happened several times when I was in the supply chain. So, all right, Justin, so let's follow up on that. So like, why does that happen? Like, why can't we find this middle ground between, you know, having the right, the right parts and, you know, or versus having, you know, too many of, the, of one and not enough of the other? Yeah, it, it goes back to what, what Melissa had mentioned. It's that classic struggle of procurement versus operations. You know, so procurement sourcing, they're focused on things like cost reduction, you know, preferred suppliers, volume buying, <clears throat> You know, that overall purchasing optimization. And on, on the other hand, you have operations. They're focused on you know, eliminating downtime, optimizing throughput and yield, um, and really just keeping the plan and assets up and running. You know, so bottom line, there's different tensions, largely because there's different incentives. You know, and then you look at today's supply chain environment. You know, it's probably more challenging than ever. And so on one hand, you have procurement dealing with 
Um, inflation at you know, say nine to ten percent a year, um, it's certainly impacting material prices, and they're trying to to limit that. On the other hand, you have lead times that are um, you know more uncertain and volatile than ever. You know, so you have operations wanting to increase inventory to deal with you know the the lead time volatility, and make sure they have the right part. Um, so with these different incentives and, and today's challenging environment, uh, it's really not uncommon to you know that that. It's not unexpected that you see supply chain struggle with this. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Melissa, do you have anything you want to kind of add to that? Um, yeah, I would say the the other thing to think about, too, is not only on the incentives piece, but a lot of times people aren't on the same page with data. So I've, I've been in meetings where we'll run reports thinking we have the picture of the same thing, but they'll be out of time sync. So, you know, somebody will have run it two hours ago, somebody will have run it a day before. And as your inventory changes, that can make a very big difference in, in how you're viewing the picture. And a lot of times, you know, that's what leads to that siloed piece of, hey, procurement's here and the mill ops are over here. And they're, they're talking a little bit of different language because you can't get them on the same page of music. So in, in my opinion, this, this becomes a data you know, a data problem and a visibility problem. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. So, I mean, not only are we dealing with these like competing initiatives, but then if we're not all using the same data or at least, you know, within the same, you know, I guess the same network of data, right? Then we, then we don't know exactly what it is that we're looking at, right? So we, we may get one group that's saying, oh yeah, we looked at that and it's fine. And another group's like, no, we just ran it again. And actually, you know, we're way off. So it's, it's one of those things that we have to find this balance, but what if we could, what if we no longer had to choose between, you know, the, the risk reduction versus the optimized cost and, you could streamline these competing initiatives and really start to optimize at a plant or a network level because, or the enterprise level even more. So, because we talk a lot about, you know, individual facilities, but what if we were then able to establish a network effect, right? But, you know, that can be confusing to some people because network effect gets used pretty commonly or in a lot of different ways and can change depending on the context, right? So, um, it's probably best if we take some time to kind of like, you know, exp explain to our audience what we mean when we talk about the network effect here at Barrison. So Melissa, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to, you know, to take this one. Sure. Thank you, Josh. So when I think about a network, it's, it's, this is how we define it at Barrison, right? So if you, you think about a manufacturing footprint, you have a global footprint, each, each of those sites is their own entity. Now, you might have sites that are close to one another, so it could be regional, it could be by country, and as you combine those sites, what happens is that that demand tends to smooth across the sites, and you can then look, and, and those sites can share inventory back and forth, so what ends up happening is you have a much bigger optimization opportunity, so we think of networks even within that a company's footprint, but as you, if you can use your, your mind, you could also think of a network being um, not only that company's footprint, but now maybe I pull in the suppliers as well, and you make an even greater network, and then the supplier suppliers, and that's where the, the power comes. As you get that visibility of demand and supply, you can really start to optimize the, the working capital across that entire value chain, and everybody needs less, and it becomes, that's where the real power comes, and, and we have that digitally integrated supply chain that's, that everybody's looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Justin, why don't you explain where you've seen some of the benefits of like this network effect that Melissa's describing? Yeah, um, thanks, Josh. Before we jump into that, I want to I give an example of what, you know, one of our customers experienced that, you know, real life example of, of uh, the challenges around sharing that information. You know, so we, we it's very common for, uh, for companies to have different you know, systems of record or ERPs across you know, different business units, across different plants. Um, where it's very difficult for them to see, you know, where they have duplicate materials at other locations, where they, they have opportunities to share, you know, when you're, when you're stock out, stocking out in an emergency uh, situation, you know, oftentimes you don't know which other plants near you, you can go to, to, to get some help. You know, so one of our customers, they're a big, you know, Fortune 500 manufacturing customer. They have, um, you know, a different, different system for every single one of their plants. 
where there's just no way to see inventory, really any, any material information at a plant that could be, you know, five miles down the road. Um, so one, one of the things they've, they've really been able to leverage Verison for is the powerful search capability and really having that visibility is so key in those, those situations where instead of having to, you know, say what, what their prior process was of sending out an email to you know, basically every plant, you know, a lot of times store room managers are out on the floor, they may not see it until the end of the day, um, you know, emergency situations, you lose a day, it could be millions of dollars. Um, so they're going from this process of sending an email out. We're now thinking to search within one system, having that visibility is so, so key. Um, so another challenge we see along those lines is, you know, I'd say companies, companies recognize the value of having um, you know, a database or centralized location to see materials across the whole network. But one, one of the things we find is tools like you know, Excel either can't handle the amount of information um, you know, you want to pull in things like POs and, and you know, valuable, valuable information like that, um, or even if it can handle the information, you know, it's just, it's a real challenge to keep it updated in real time, um, where it's really a, a valuable system. You know, then take into account, you know, on, on another hand, even if you have all the information, it's still really hard for humans to, to process it, to make the right decisions. You know, so you're looking at all these different variables, um, you know, and you're going say material by material, it can take a lot of time to, to make the right inventory decisions. Um, and then lastly, so say you figure out, you know, you have, have one system, um, you have individuals that can make those right decisions, you know, then you're faced with how do you prioritize all these materials? So, you, you know, you have a list of 100,000 items, where do you start? It becomes really, really challenging to make a, an impact when you're going material by material, you know, you could go through 100 materials and not have really in any real impact on the business. Yeah, so all that, you know, what we tend to see, it's, it's really, really challenging for our, our, comp our customers to optimize, um, you know, without a tool like Verison. Um, you know, so they, they start to look at expanding data sources and, you know, when you can get to, to that supplier level data, like Melissa mentioned, mm -hmm. it becomes really, really powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's interesting that you pointed out, you know, even if you do have it, you know, a tool such as Excel or something like that, that is capable, or you do have the clean data that is capable of putting all of these things in front of you. You still just don't have enough time or people to go through these items, particularly when you're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of items, you know, there's, there's just, just no way that organizations could scale to meet these needs, right? So, you mentioned spreadsheets, right? So that's you know something that's more of a traditional method. And we're learning more and more that you know these traditional methods just don't cut it anymore, right? I mean, they, um, and as a result, people are turning to purpose-built solutions. And you know, we we know that a lot of you know advancements have been made prior to the pandemic, and then the pandemic came along and almost just really accelerated the need for more digital transformation, faster digital transformation, being able to implement new systems to, to keep you not just you know, competitive, but strategically place you uh, up for the future to more or less future-proof your supply chain so that we don't see you know, repeats of what's happened in the past. So Gartner has released their supply chain trends for 2022. Right? And you know, these things have been uh, a lot of these things have been pretty consistent over the, uh, the past few years, but you know, one thing that stood out from the report was that 34% of supply chain leaders said that they are adapting to new technology, that that adapting to new technology is the most important strategic change supply chain organizations will face five years from now. I would make the argument, I think we would make the argument that five years is probably still too far out. Right? We need to start thinking about these things a lot, lot sooner than five years out. But some of the things that they were really pointing out uh, as larger trends are hyper automation 2.0, which is in a more accelerated digital transformation, right? Using robotic process automation, automating processes like data input and management. And I think it's you know important to point out that these types of automations don't replace workers. And I think that was a big fear for a long time. It was, it was going to replace people, but really it just augments your workforce and gives them the ability to do uh, more strategic things than focusing on the mundane task. 
But with that in mind, you know, Justin, th these are just a few things. What do you think, or what else have you seen that have been driving these trends towards, uh, you know, this, these hyper automation, this RPA, you know, things like that? Yeah, great, great question, Josh. And you certainly don't go a day without hearing, hearing about automation or thinking about automation, you know, for roles or people, whatever the case. Um, you know, a couple, a couple of the big things that we're seeing, you know, one around, around labor challenges in general. You know, so one, it's labor shortages. You know, you, you hear almost every day around the you know, restaurants, you can't hire people or at mm -hmm. the low levels. You also see that a lot in, in manufacturing mm -hmm. uh, you know, plants. You know, a lot of times it's, it's smaller towns and they may not have the workforce locally to, to support the plant at the level they want. So there's some real labor shortages. You know, on the flip side of that, you have a, an aging workforce, you know, so again, with, you know, a lot of this labor is, you see people have been working in plants 30 or 40 years, a lot of knowledge, you know, and these people are slowly aging out of the workforce and, and there's not necessarily the um, kind of the young, young people to backfill them that, um, you know, really, really keep the plant running like it should. So with these two challenges, you see really a need for technology to replace, you know, you know some of this labor, but also to make sure you're capturing the knowledge as people are aging out. You know, you couple that with the advances being made in, in AI and ML, machine learning. Um, you know, so I don't know, five, 10 years ago, you know, the, these, these would get tossed around a lot, you know, but it's a little bit more of a buzzword than, um, than being implemented in the day to day. What we've seen over the last couple of years is, you know, companies are utilizing, leveraging um, AI, machine learning more and more in the day-to-day -day operations, um, so it's, it's really come a, a long way. You know, so what, what that's enabling companies to do is historically, you know, going back to the, the data challenges, you know, companies are spending, say, 80% of their time pulling together data, you know, getting different systems, you know, in, in one Excel, getting everything in the same format, um, you know, you're spending a bunch of time um, just laying, laying everything out, getting, getting everything in the right view, um, you know, checking the data, things like that. You know, then you'd spend about 20% of your time actually, you know, reviewing it and making action, actionable decisions, you know, doing, doing really the things that benefit the company. So what a lot of this um, AI is doing nowadays is you, you're kind of flipping that on its head where you're spending, you know, 20% of your time gathering data. You know, you're, you're mapping data, you're, you're harmonizing in a way where it's very accessible, um, you know, very repeatable and automated in a lot of ways. And then you're spending 80% of your time actually, you know, making decisions that benefit the business. You know, so you're, you're making stocking policy decisions or looking where you can share parts across plants or leveraging, you know, your network, um, which really, really flipping, you know, flipping that 80-20 on its head is becoming more and more common. It's become extremely powerful. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's that's a huge point that you make there, that being able to flip it into that, you know, the 20 percent into the data gathering and then 80 percent into the, you know, the taking action, which is huge, because as you mentioned, with the labor shortages, you know, uh, supply chain has been one of the areas to experience the highest levels of turnover over the past two years. I think it was almost in the 60 percent, if I do recall that recently from a report that was um, actually, it was LinkedIn that was tracking. It was the first time that LinkedIn had been tracking, you know, turnover within particular areas. And that was one of the things that they had pointed out. So it also just adds to the disruption that we've seen over the past several years. But so, you know, we talked to, you know, before, uh, before going into that, Justin, we mentioned um, purpose-built solutions. And so Melissa, you know, we've talked about purpose-built solution, but Let's explain again, what does a purpose solution mean and what kind of intelligence can it provide? Yeah, thanks, Josh. I'm, I'm glad you gave me that question because I, I love to answer this one. So when I think about, and, and I'm going to keep up with uh, analogy day here on mm -hmm. Ask the Experts. So as I think about purpose-built solutions, um, to me, it's it, it's kind of like having a doctor, right? So um, I have a primary care physician that I go to for just about everything, but I, I had uh, last year, I had to get my hip replaced. I did not use my primary care for that, right? I went to a specialist who knew how to do that 
specific surgery, had done it thousands of times with teaching others how to do it. They they were the, or he was the expert. So that's how I think about purpose-built solutions. So my, clearly my hip doctor didn't replace my primary care. They worked in concert so that I could have the best health possible. And I think it's very similar with, with technology. Purpose-built solutions are designed to do something very, very well. And they complement other um, software things like like an ERP that's designed to do a very broad set of skills. So um, that's how I think about Verison with MRO, right? That's what we do. That's what we focus on. That's what we're great at. And we complement ERPs by bolting on and taking the information you get from ERP, letting the ERPs do what they do really well. And then we focus in on that MRO. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a really, really good way to put it, right? Because, you know, that's the thing is we... I think we're inherently think that if we adopt a new solution, it's supposed to replace an old one, you know, but right. that's not necessarily the case, right? You know, it's, it can augment, it can extend that capability, like this, that expertise. And that's exactly as you mentioned. Right? So that's a good way for us to segue into kind of some of the ways that we've been helping some people. And, you know, just, you know, we've been around for a little while, you know, we're here in Atlanta, based here in Atlanta, you know, helping people all over the globe though. Um, you know, we're working with some of the top CPG companies. As Justin mentioned, we got a Fortune 500 uh, company that we work with. We are working with some of the top three energy companies, right? And we've recently seen customers, you know, with our platform verify, you know, over a million dollars in inventory reduction in about five hours with two users. Uh, we've had another company identify $20 million worth of inventory optimization, optimization in the first 60 days, you know, and then one of our customers that recently just got up on the platform, they had one person identify $300,000 worth of optimization. And that's more than they've ever been able to do before on their own, right? So that, you know, again, putting these purpose-built solutions that are, you know, powered by, you know, the ML and the AI that's no longer just a buzzword, but something that actually, you know, is providing real benefits quickly um, is something that, you know, we're helping organizations realize and, you know, um, really wanting them to be able to utilize on a regular basis. But Justin, you know, once you share some additional details of how you've seen how our platform is helping organizations scale this with materials across the network. Yeah, that's that's a great question, Josh. The keyword being scale there. <clears throat> I mean, so you, you got to start with with the data. You know, it's it's you know really challenging to do to do any of this without having a, a good data foundation. You know, so what companies have done historically, there may be you know master data cleanup projects, you know, multi million dollar, multi year projects, um, and they have their place and they're they're valuable in, in certain ways. But Verison doesn't. We we don't take that approach. Instead, we we sit on top of you know, ERPs like SAP. Um, and what we do is we, we harmonize that data. So we, we can pull data from different different sources, different ERPs, you know, different plants. Um, and really we, we, we map it and get it all in one workable, um, you know, data format, a foundational format um, that allows us to, to then apply, you know, things like AI and ML to really, really leverage that data. You know, another thing Verison's able to do um, is, Working with all these customers in different industries, different verticals, uh, there's a lot of a lot of key learnings, you know, from working with all these different customers. It's, you know, really really challenging for our customers to to gain these learnings from only working within their four walls. You know, so having a broad broad range of customers and, and you know, learning from a data format across the board has been extremely valuable. And it's really hard to repeat it within your organization, um, within your four walls. You know, uh, one last point I'll, I'll bring up is um, when you have these different, you know, organizations within your company, um, you know, different different incentives, um, it, it's really hard to, to look at data, uh, like Melissa mentioned earlier, you know, look at the same data in an unbiased view, remaking making decisions using, using that same view. So, so Verison is able to present the data, easy format, everyone's looking at the same same data has the same source of information to make, you know, what a lot of times it makes really easy decisions when, you know, say procurement operations are, are, are looking at the same view and there's, there's, there's not those different perspectives there. So it's really about creating that simple, quick way 
to, to pull in your data, it's repeatable to harmonize that data, but then you know, give you the right information at your fingertips to make the right decisions. Absolutely. And so, you know, as we've mentioned, you know, it's just the way that you can use this technology and then being able to, you know, take it to the network level. Melissa, you know, do procurement and operations leaders finally have this chance to kind of break down these barriers between competing initiatives and start to, as you were talking about earlier, sing the same tune? Yeah, it's it's absolutely possible and we've seen it work um, time and time again. So as, as Justin alluded to, having that screen with all, all the data in one place where you can make um, an informed and yet quick decision is so valuable. Plus now, because the, the data is the same, people pull up, they see the same thing, it's at the same time cadence. Um, people are very reasonable, right? They can very quickly come to an agreement um, having all the same data. So I, I think that's really powerful. And we've seen that with our customers time and time again. The other kind of exciting part about that is if you if you take that concept and now you you layer the our, our trusted network module on it, we can get those those uh, really powerful views across across sites and, and also potentially pulling in suppliers, right? Where we now you're you're optimizing across that value chain and that creates such such powerful results. So, you know, again, driving towards that digitally integrated supply chain. So, you know, to, to sum it all up, Josh, I think the the beauty of Verison that we've seen for our customers anyway, it, it takes people out of that kind of grind of having to do a lot of um, data analysis in Excel or having to go through a, a pretty lengthy data clean cleanse. You can set Verison right on top and we'll we'll be able to do that much more efficiently. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the other benefits that we you know, we talk about a lot is, and Justin alluded to this earlier, was, you know, the fact that it, it does learn from what the users do, right? So, like, it does pick up, you know, what their decisions that they've made within how that affects the data. And that way, it is repeatable. And it's always, you know, that knowledge is captured within the system. So that in the event you do have, let's say, some retirement or some turnover, you know, you're not starting over every couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, Josh. That change management is so important. And people are, it, it, we're, I've been focused on it in just about every company I've worked with. So it's it's a really important concept to think about. Absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, that um, does give us a little bit of time left to answer some of the uh, questions that have come in. We've had just a few today. But um, so, Melissa, I'm going to start off uh, this first one with you, it says, our company is invested in an ERP and an EAM system, but can't they do this? Yeah, it comes back to, um, it's a really good question. We get that a lot. And I, I think the answer is they're, they're somewhat designed to do that. But really, when you think about what an ERP and an EAM system are designed for, it's really not inventory optimization. They're, they're designed to do a very specific thing. And just like Verison is designed to do a very specific thing as well. So we'll, we have the ability to, to build on to those two systems and, and, and do that analysis and that optimization in a much, much greater capacity. Right, absolutely. Because, you know, if, when you tend to think about it, right, ERP is just more of a system of record, right, to, you know, handle all of your transactional data, and whereas your EAM is more of a maintenance schedule. So it tells you when something may need to be fixed, but it doesn't, as you mentioned, doesn't do the inventory aspect. It doesn't tell you where your parts are located in your facility, across your network, what your levels are, you know, so... Yeah, hundred percent. The other thing to think about too, at least my experience with my ERP, it was almost impossible to get everything on one screen. I used yeah. to download everything to Power BI's, and I had like five or six dashboards. I was jockeying at any time to kind of figure out what was going on. Uh, it would have been nice to have everything on one screen, so I could have uh, made made probably quicker decisions and have everybody on the same page. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, thank you for that. So, uh, Justin, this one's this one's for you because you've. Uh, been mentioning, you know, the data earlier says, you know, talking about bad data. So with this system, are data cleanses required? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Josh. It's one we get um, really all the time. Um, I mean, so short answer is no. Um, you know, so data cleanses certainly have their place. There's, you know, there can be a lot of value there. You know, but one of the things we find is they can take a long time or, you know, by the, by the time you finish, you're, you're kind of restarting. Um, whereas, you know, Verison is intended to, you know, to get, get you up and running quickly. You know, we 
we focus on sitting on top of your data and harmonizing it rather than you know necessarily going in there and cleaning it. Um, you know, so by sitting on top of it and harmonizing that data, you know, we're getting value to our customers, you know, 30, 60, 90 days out. You know, customers are, are fully up and running in the platform, usually around 45 days. Um, and that's that's so valuable, especially in today's environment where where things are moving quickly. Um, you know, and also sitting on top of on top of your data like that, you know, it, it allows us to, to more quickly adapt to your data and take in new data, and, and it's certainly uh, repeatable. So um, I'd say, you know, to answer your question, no data cleanses are, are not required. Yeah, excellent. Because, you know, that's the thing, being able to start quickly, you know, that's a, that's a key point because, you know, if you, data, data cleanses, you know, as helpful as they can be at times are lengthy and can, you know, take a while to, to, to figure all that out and get all that set before then you can begin to implement the change management that Melissa was mentioning earlier as well. So, uh, and this next question, um, I think both of you will have commentary on. So, um, Liz, I'm going to start with you, and then Justin, I'd like to hear your feedback on this as well. It says, MRO is not really a priority for, for us right now. How can I convince my manager and company leaders that this is important? Yeah, that is such a great question, because um, that's that's in a way the root of all the opportunity in MRO. MRO is typically never an area of focus. So I, I, my analogy, again, it's analogy day, um, is it's kind of like your junk drawer at home, right? Things just keep accumulating in there and then one day you can't open the drawer. And um, so that's how I would think about it. Although it's not an area of focus, it's an area ripe for optimization. It's also a really nice way, um, I will say a low risk way, to try that optimization opportunity before you, you turn on the, the Verison for other things like direct materials and, and areas of, of probably even greater spend. Absolutely. Justin, your thoughts? Yeah, Melissa, I really like the uh, that junk, junk drawer analogy. I've never thought of it quite like that. Um, yeah, I mean, so, you know, so when you think about MRO, well, I mean, so think about raw materials that finished goods first. You know, there tends to be a lot of, you know, kind of other factors in the decisioning. You have, you have to think about demand, production scheduling, you know, all these factors that, that you know, make it a little bit more challenging to, um, to, to make inventory decisions that you have to take account for. Where you think about M MRO, on the other hand, you know, we, MRO tends to be fairly predictable. You know, there's, there's a lot of parts that are replaced at, at regular cadences. Um, and, and it's really a way to get a, a quick win in a lot of cases. You know, we, we have customers that have you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, MRO materials, and they're able to, in a lot of cases, find 10, 20, 30 million dollars of benefit within that first year, which is just sitting out there. So um, with MRO being, you know, fairly predictable, a little bit simpler, um, you know, than some of the other types of inventory that are typically you know, kind of more in the forefront, there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier on, you know, if, if we are, in fact, facing an economic, economic downturn or, you know, a recession around the corner, you know, getting, getting a lot of that excess inventory off the books is probably a high priority for, you know, uh, a lot of organizations out there. I think we've already seen it with some of our customers as well. So. Yep. Yeah, we have. Yeah. All right. Well, that was good. Well, that wraps up all the questions that we had. So, um, uh, I thank you both for you know joining me today, you know, and um, giving us these great insights. Uh, as always, as mentioned before, we will send out the recording after you know, the, the event ends. Um, if you would like to learn more about some of the things that we do, or even get a firsthand look at you know what the platform looks like, we do invite you to join Verison.com. We do have a kind of quick tour demo that you can go through. Uh, we invite you to do that. Uh, you can always connect with this on LinkedIn. Uh, I know I'm available on LinkedIn. If you have any additional questions, Justin, Melissa, I assume that's a good spot for you all as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely welcome it. Yeah. yeah, please. Would love to hear from you. All right, absolutely. So again, we thank you for your time today, and we look forward to seeing you in our next session of Ask the Experts. Thank you all. Thank you.